Hello and welcome to another episode of the HLS Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Ritter. You can call me ND Tex. And as always, you can join us live over on twitch.tv slash for little sons. You can find the podcast over on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you may subscribe to podcasts at. Come join us in Discord. That is our live chat channel, herloyalsons.com slash Discord. Of course, you can always find us at our home at herloyalsons.com. With that being said, uh, Shane, we had actual football. Kind of. <laughs> we had the most insane football possible. And it's exactly how you want the season to come back. I'm sorry. I am a full advocate for week zero from now on. It, it was beautiful. It was stupid. But uh, while we're not going to be here to talk about Florida kind of showing their ass as a top 10, um, <laughs> just a little bit, we are here with Chris. You may know him as Rakes of the Rakes Report at Rakes and Mello on Twitter. Chris, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing all right, guys. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Well, uh, thanks for taking the time to come on. I know both you and I have both had crazy travel days, so we're 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 going to be uh, as delirious as possible pulling this off. But I we got actual Notre Dame football that's going to happen this week, even though it's on Monday. Uh, so what we decided to do kind of did something like this last year, folks. If you uh, caught that, we kind of you know. Rakes, if you haven't subscribed to that newsletter, uh, make sure you do that uh, and go subscribe to the Rakes Report. Highly, highly recommend it. And Chris, where can they do that? What's the link uh, for them to be able to sign up? Uh, tinyletter.com slash Rakes Report. Or if you go to my Twitter, which is just uh, twitter.com slash Rakes and Mallow, all the links are there as well. Perfect. Yeah, so go subscribe. So what, one of the things we, we love uh, about the Rakes Report is, is the ability to Put, do two things. Put things in perspective very well. Uh, not, not a whole lot of knee-jerking there. But also, um, Chris has the, the great ability to, to be able to find, find the positive, the good about the season. And, and quite frankly, put it in a way that makes you want to end up running through walls. So that's what we're going to try to do here. It is full hype train. Uh, and we'll see after this is over if we can't convince you all that it's 14-0 Natty uh, at the end of this. <laughs> Full homer. Let's just do it. Let's just go full homer today, or, or tonight rather, this morning, whenever you're listening to this. Uh, but that doesn't mean we won't, we won't, if there's stuff that worries us, we will mention it, but that's where we're going to kind of lean into the the more crazy homer side. Uh, so with that said, Chris, I mean, just just looking at the schedule right now, I, I know a lot's being made of three particular games, uh, and they are all on the road at Georgia, at, at Michigan, and at Stanford. Uh, is that your focus right now as far as uh, things that you're overly hyped about? Are you just ready for the season to get started, focus on another game? What is your kind of outlook for what you're looking forward to? Oh, I think the Georgia game is everyone's focused on that, understandably. Louisville, I think the Irish are a 20-point favorite. So it's an opening night game. It, they're going to play hard. Louisville has a new coach. Their old coach hated them, apparently. So they're going to be excited to like play for a staff that really cares about them. Uh, the sec the second game is against Bob Davy in New Mexico. So these should not. It's a nice like working your way into the into the trip to Athens. The problem <laughs> the trip to Athens just looms very large. Like when you start ticking off the the talent they have, a lot of people have them projected to the playoff. And so it's kind of tough. I, I feel like maybe people are trying to hang the season on that game. I, Notre Dame can't get ran off the field like they did against Miami. But if they lose, you know, by a touchdown or ten points in Athens, like they can still have a really great season because of those other games you mentioned, which are, you know, places they struggled to win in Ann Arbor and Palo Alto, but they're these, this Michigan team and the Stanford team are very beatable for, for Notre Dame this year. Yeah. And, and Shane, I don't know about how you're looking at it because Georgia, yeah, it'd be great to win. Uh, obviously I'm, I'm nervous about it, but as long as, as we don't do, uh, you know, a full ass showing, I, I guess, you know, since we mentioned that with Florida, as long as we, we don't shoot ourselves in the foot, I'm going to be happy with the results. So Shane, what are you, uh, how are you feeling about Georgia? I think, yeah, I think on the serious side, the, the big concern for me isn't just that it's, uh, you know, unwinnable and they'll have to defy odds to achieve success. It's mostly that regardless of, of the outcome, it's, it's important that it remain respectable. And I think that is even more important after the way the Clemson loss was framed at the end of the season. Um, you know, Notre Dame was the quick first punching back to line up and say, look, they got smoked. They didn't belong. Mm -hmm. And then everyone seemed to forget that as soon as Alabama got its ass boat raced. <laughs> um, and yet, but somehow during the course of the offseason, that seemed to kind of revert back. 
no one seems to remember much about Alabama getting its ass exposed, but everyone seems to remember a lot about Notre Dame getting exposed. Even though, again, the first half wasn't really that that disparate. So, so I mean, I guess what I'm hoping for is that there is a consistent level of competitive play at Georgia. I do believe it is in the cards, somewhere in the deck, that a win could come out. I don't believe that it's like a, a, a foregone conclusion that Notre Dame is just going to walk into an L. But I'm looking at it in terms of like, so long as it stays competitive throughout the game, that's that's going to be that's going to still propel them towards the, the I guess the relatively expected success for the, the rest of the season. Yeah, that there's makes- there's a lot of other things to look at too. I mean, I can't remember Notre Dame being on primetime CBS as well. Uh, and then I forget what the other, uh, I, I want to say it's Alabama LSU is the other game going on that same week. And yet Notre Dame, Georgia has top billing. So yeah, I'm nervous as hell, but that's, there's a lot of exciting shit to come around there. So uh, right, and, Notre Dame can definitely, they can definitely win that game. It's just the people, it, it's, it's a tough, it's going to be a tough one, yeah. but if you're going to do that, you want to go in with a senior quarterback. You want to go in with the defensive line that can maybe make Jake Fromm's life a little bit tough. And those are two things Notre Dame has. They're going to have to catch a couple breaks. They're going to have, I mean, DeAndre Swift is very good. The whole Georgia offensive line that were freshmen and sophomores when they played in South Bend two years ago, they, they growed up. Uh, and, you know, and it's a Kirby smart defense. It's definitely a situation where Notre Dame can win. It's just like people cannot decide if the season is a failure or not because of whether they beat Georgia. Because that's that's a tough ask for any team in, in the country. I mean, this is a team that had Bama on the ropes two years in a row. Uh, and, you know, they decided not to show up for the Sugar Bowl for reasons unknown. So hopefully they decide not to show up for this one. I would love to be – I would love for that Sunday to be spent with them saying, well, it was an SEC game, but Georgia didn't care. I would take that. That would be fine. That would be great. Sure. Let the record show. Yeah, so, for sure. So we just need to find the Irish equivalent of Bevo to roam on the sidelines and attack Uga because I think that's what – that's what seemed to turn everything there in the Sugar Bowl. <laughs> what can we do there? I may show up at this game. <laughs> yeah, well, as Irish Elvis uh, points out in the chat, uh, he's trying to trigger me right now, saying that uh, the team as a Notre Dame is used to seeing red in the stands as they're playing Georgia. <laughs> I, I still, still, I still will never get over that. But uh, one thing you mentioned, Chris, is that defensive line. I am incredibly excited to watch them just wreck all kinds of havoc, especially because, it, it, at least to me, if the season goes like it should for especially some of the winnable games, more winnable ones like Louisville, for instance, the script should be Notre Dame gets out to lead, other team tries to catch up, has to pass a lot, God help you, Julian O'Quar is going to kill you. I mean, how are you feeling about the defensive line? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, you just you just laid it out. You guys watch a lot of college football, as do I. And just objectively, if a team has a great defensive line, which I think Notre Dame has, I mean, the defensive ends are at least great. And I have high hopes for that, the defensive interior. I mean, even Jerry, Jerry Tillery is gone, but also Jerry Tillery played the last half of last season with like one arm, uh, basically. And so that's what I, I think maybe that MTA and Hyannish and Lacey and Adam Alola and Howard Crott, there's a bunch of guys who wrote it in. The depth is We've never we've never seen this. I mean, we're we're approximately the same age here, and not in my like watching the Irish have they had a defensive line with this kind of depth. And so when you pair that with an offense that at least is going to be good, like maybe it's not going to be. I know earlier in the offseason there were talk, oh man, can they score forty points a game between injuries and maybe not being sure about the offensive line? But we know that an offense with Ian Book and Chase Claypool and Chris Fink and a bunch of running backs and they return four of the five, it's going to be a good offense. So. When you put those things together in college football, a, a quarterback who led the was right up there in accuracy for a lot of last season, and a defensive line can get after the passer, and then you start like throwing in uh, Alohi Gilman and Jalen Elliott and Kyle Hamilton and these dudes on the back to ball hawk. Like it's a nice. You can see how you can win a bunch of games that way and do that in a fun way. Yeah, and uh, I mean, we even referenced a little bit about how sloppy Week Zero was, but the thing that kept Florida in that game despite how much they were screwing everything up was their pass rush yep. and, and wrecking havoc on young quarterbacks, which that's what people I think forget is that uh, in the college game, you, you try to throw everything out on paper, but then at the same time, it's 
these are kids out there. They are not professionals and they are prone to being able to get thrown into a little bit of a panic themselves. And if that panic is caused by our, uh, our, our, our pass rush or just the defensive line getting penetration, then all of a sudden those concerns that you have about linebacker and maybe your, your number two and number three corners kind of goes away a little bit because it's amazing how good a pass rush can make them look. I mean, it's not even so much that the concerns go away because I still think, you know, there are question marks that that bear, uh, you know, proof. You know, like we still need to see exactly what the secondary is made of. I understand that we've got Troy Pride and Sean Crawford seems to be coming back on as the number one, number two, if that were a terminology. But like <laughs> I like it. But you know what I mean? Like the, the, the defensive line being that capable of wreaking havoc, it creates their that the, that the floor of their performance is a level of consistency where the corners now get a chance to kind of shine brighter. It, it's 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 almost so foregone when you ha- when you end up having a, a pass rush like that 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 the passing game is going to be erratic. That things tend to go in your way, and I think that that's kind of what, what I what I'm waiting to see. I expect the defensive line to be nightmarish. I mean, n- not just Julian Okwar; he's kind of the main force I expect to be a nightmare on the defensive line but I just think in general across the board the collective you know the the ripple effect if you will of having somebody like that on the line they're going to be good they're going to be I think they're going to penetrate very well and especially if we if we can see what Jacob Lacey's actually doing versus what we're hearing he's doing I think he's going to be much better than I, than I think we're prepared for mentally but um I I just want to see what that does for the secondary because you have a kid like Kyle Hamilton waiting for a shot <laughs> And it sounds like he's really good at finding them. So, <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just, these are all the things that have that, that the, the trappings of a, of a potentially very successful defense. And that, like Chris said, complements an established good offense. Yeah. And, and, and it'd be awesome to see Kyle Hamilton make an impact. And uh, I don't know, say in Ann Arbor, uh, yeah. <laughs> be, because I, I know everybody uh, seems to, have it's amazing how Michigan ends up getting the uh, benefit of the doubt. Uh, it's like, oh, all they did was change an offensive coordinator. They'll be fine. Oh, Shea Patterson this year, it'll be okay. Uh, and I don't know, uh, Chris, when you look at that Michigan game as well, I mean, obviously it's, it's not going to be, uh, it's still, I think, clearly in the toss-up category. will be a tough game, but um, one, I like that it's going to be in the middle of the season, so we don't have to do a whole lot of pronostication when it gets to that point. But, I mean, as we sit there now, I mean, I still like the matchup as about as much as I liked it the first time, which was still nerve-wracking, but I didn't feel like it was hopeless. How are you feeling about uh, that game, Chris? I I feel pretty good about it. I mean, like you said, we're going to have a better idea of what Michigan is. The nice thing is Notre Dame will be coming off a bye, and Michigan will be coming off a trip to Happy Valley against a Penn State team that's starting, I feel like, over the last couple weeks to get some hype as a potential, like, Big Ten champion sleeper. The Michigan thing, I... Honestly, I was having a, an email with uh, with a friend the other day about this and like, why are they being picked to make the playoff? And I feel like 80 percent of it is basically like the, the National College Football Punditry saying, well, we thought that Michigan was going to make the playoff under Jim Harbaugh and they haven't yet. And so I guess they kind of have to. And then <laughs> like Josh Gaddis may be a great offensive coordinator. He, he could be. I mean, he's you know, he worked under James Franklin, worked under Nick Saban. Sure. They play uh, at Penn State. They play at Wisconsin. At home, they have Iowa, Notre Dame, Ohio State, and Michigan State. Are they? You telling me they're going to go? I, they would have to go what five and one against that to make the playoff, and then they'd have to win the West again, and also, you know, not drop a game at Indiana, not drop the game to Army early in the season. And the other thing that we, I mean, I've been discussing this is they're just assumed that the defense is going to be good because it's a Don Brown defense. They lost Chase Winovich, who, for his delusional comments after they lost to Notre Dame, was a insanely good college defensive end. They lost Devin Bush, who was a first-round pick in the NFL draft, a linebacker. They have talent. They've recruited well. But I'm a little curious. This team gave up over 100 points over its last two games, and we're just, okay, I guess they're good again. Uh, I mean, we'll see, maybe. And they're getting a lot of love for an offensive line Well, that, in the early season, Notre Dame fans will remember, did not look particularly good against Notre Dame defensive line. At the end of the season, they did not look particularly good <laughs> against Florida. Uh, they did average four yards per carry against Ohio State, which is pretty good until you look and see the previous week, Maryland averaged seven yards per carry against Ohio State. So I'm, I'm very interested. Michigan could legitimately be good next year, or next year in two weeks, but they also could go eight and four. Like, that's not off the table. 
it, and that thing can spiral on them so quickly just because there is so much pressure on Jim Harbaugh. And if he can't win there, they should probably just shut the program down because he was supposed to win there. And I think they should have honor and decency and just end playing football in Ann Arbor. It seems like the best way to do it. I mean, it, it is the only right and honorable thing. I think any Michigan, true Michigan man would see that if they're truly going to do things the right way, I mean, Harbaugh already said it's hard enough to keep up with those cheating SEC folks and in another John U. Bacon book because that needed to happen again. <laughs> I love that that dude just throwing rocks around in his glass house, like saying, yeah, it's hard to keep up with the SEC when he can't even, he, he hasn't even appeared in a Big Ten title game. It's 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 so beautiful. It makes yeah, I was going to so say happy. that he's supposed to be in the playoff, but they haven't like broken third place in their conference. <laughs> no. So, I'm, they, they, I, I, so see, to me, Chris, like, Maybe it's just my Michigan hatred speaking, but I don't find this shit interesting. I find this shit annoying because there is no, like, what frame of reality is informing the opinion up to now? That's, that, that's, that's what begs the question to me. Is like, I understand that it's kind of like they're trying to prognosticate and predict, but really they're using... Their justification for all that is supposedly framed around this idea that what? I just, I, that's the question that no one seems to answer because it's not Shea Patterson. It's not their defense. It's not one coordinator walking through a door. It's not, that's not what gives you a playoff projection. It just seems like, I don't know. Oh, maybe Urban Meyer left this year, so fuck it. Let's just call it Michigan, <laughs> right? That is 100% a big part of it. It's just like, uh, Urban Meyer's not there, and they play Ohio State at home. Okay, cool. Great. Yeah. The other logo I recognize the most. Fuck it. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, let's let's talk about uh, a few of the other things that uh, at least I'm looking forward to, or at least maybe I'm selfishly looking forward to. Like, Bob Davey didn't abuse me as an Irish fan because my consciousness happened after uh, Davey, which I would say, thank God, but Willingham is what started me as, as an Irish fan. Um, but man, getting the one, two combo of getting to host Bob Davey and BVG, I'm honestly kind of giddy to put up like a combined 120 points on both of those teams. <laughs> am I, am I too vindictive? Or are you, are you looking forward to, uh, any of that as well, Chris? No, that'll be that'll be really fun. Hopefully, we get a lot of a lot of the backups, a lot of a lot of Phil Jerkovic to Braden Lindsay, uh, just bombs in the in the third and fourth quarters of those games. Bob Davey also predates uh, my fandom. The BVG thing, I still can't believe that this is a real thing that a <laughs> Division One program has Scott Loeffler and Brian Van Gorder, one as head coach and one as coordinator. Uh, it's gonna be. And it's nice to have those games where, considering last year, Notre Dame played a bad back team at home and won by, what, eight points. So it'll be nice to hopefully run a few of those off the field and get some rest for the dudes, especially because one of those games comes before Athens and one of those games comes before the Trojans. So I'm hoping that Julian Aquara and Ian Book and all these starters are, by the middle of the third quarter, just chilling on the bench, enjoying the enjoying the sights and sounds of Notre Dame Stadium. Oh. See. Bob Davey to me is, is like you guys said, just a name that I know is somehow related at this point. I understand, but it's the BVG game guys. It's the B <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Paul Johnson whooped his dick out and dropped it on the table <laughs> on it. I suspect we're all going to like line up <laughs> along a buffet line. And I, that's what I expect to happen. I want to see, I know no one's retiring after this game, but come on. Like we had, this is, it is how many opportunities do you get to be like you, you we remember what you did to Jalen Smith we remember oh, oh yeah. man oh, yeah the north remembers truly in this, in this one of the greatest crimes in college football and, and I love Shane's BVG supercut that is still the feature video of our YouTube channel <laughs> where Brian Van Gorder I mean and, and uh, this summarizes everything about him it's like are you making anybody any better Jay I don't know if you are and I'm just like if it weren't for him holding your fucking off defense together with duct tape and his just pure God-given talent of being amazing, you would look so bad right now. And lo and behold, Jalen exits, and oh, wait, <laughs> this scheme is terrible. <laughs> God, I still hate that man for what he did to my boy. <laughs> hey, look. Uh, just so the, the number we're trying to shoot for here is Georgia Tech at Louisville last year. They put up 66 points. They rushed for 542 yards, uh, only pass for 12. So total yardage, 554, 28 uh, first downs. And they were a, a smooth six for seven on third down. They only faced seven third downs in the entire game, scoring 62 <laughs> points. 
<laughs> so they did 66. I say minimum. Six, Come on, guys. 69? That's I'll go for that. Yeah. Uh, they'll be unshocked. They are going to be playing a Kirby Smart defense and then a Bronco Mendenhall defense. So I think it will be a nice uh, uh, transition to a Brian Vick order defense after that. <laughs> yeah. That's, it, that's fine. Mm. It, yeah, we have, uh, you know, we, we also have the uh, the Bud Foster defense as well for, for one final ride, which, yeah. you know, maybe that would have made me a little bit more nervous, but now I've actually seen that the Irish can take that out and it's they took it out on the road. Although, where that lines up, both Virginia and Virginia Tech, you know, they come after big games on the schedule. Uh, and that that seems to be the other storyline, uh, Chris. When it, when we're talking about the Notre Dame schedule, it, it, it's twofold. Everybody's got a damn bye week before they play Notre Dame, and Notre Dame has these trap games after big games. Uh, how are you feeling about? Uh, do you have any credence to that? Are you just saying out oh, of hell with it? They're just gonna, you know, they they proved last year they could do the dumbest travel schedule in the world, and that didn't affect them. So what are a couple trap games? How are you feeling about how the schedule's laying out? They're definitely they're annoying games to play after such big row games. Um, I mean, you got to play your tough games somewhere, I guess. And so, like we were talking, we get the easy games before the big row games. I don't know if that would be better to like you know flip flop and play Bowling Green after Georgia and Virginia before. I don't know how that worked. The one nice thing is Virginia Tech could be six and one or seven and zero oh when they come. At which point, like it can't be a trap game. You know, if you're playing a top twenty <laughs> team, you can maybe I guess I, the, the word classification. I guess that would be more of like a hangover game. I don't right. know how you would. Coming off Ann Arbor and Virginia, same deal. I they're not they're they're pretty close to the top twenty five, and so by the time they come to South Bend, they could be could be right. I mean, they're the coastal favorite as as voted by the media, so they are they are tough teams to play. This is Virginia's first ever trip to South Bend. I, I didn't realize that till recently. Um, the game is sold out because a lot of a lot of Cavs fans making so you can a lot of orange and blue. We talked about red in the stands earlier. You're gonna have plenty plenty of that come. Uh, September 28th, but Great. Yeah, I mean, Virginia is, a, Virginia is going to be a, a tough out, but it's also when you kind of look at like the recruiting rankings of these teams, they're not like at the level of talent that Notre Dame is. And so uh, even if coaching is only equal and they, we, the Irish staff cannot out coach these guys, the talent on the field is going to be superior to both of those Virginia schools. So hopefully between that and home field, even though they're coming off tough road games, they will be able to, you know, put it, maybe it won't be a pretty game as Notre Dame games versus Bronco Mendenhall and he's BYU. They never were, uh, but they were wins. So, you know, we'll take them, take them and move on. Hey, win- winning is hard as we all know, but, but go ahead, Shane. No, I was just going to say like the, the, the one, I guess maybe there's one, I don't believe it, but like, is there an element of like lame duck Bud Foster? Is that a thing? I mean, like, I I don't. I, and the reason why I say that is because that has never seemed to, to be the side of the ball that has been of in question at uh, Virginia Tech since Justin Fu Wente uh, has 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 come aboard. It, it seemed like they they, you know, philosophically speaking, going from, uh, you know, Beamer to. Puente, there was there seemed to be a lot of growing pains and it seemed like a most of that stuff manifested on, on offense now to be fair last season they lost their quarterback to injury um but i've i've always just kind of like the virginia tech defense element still scares the shit out of me like i just there's no there's no point where that goes away even with proven results even with they they've beaten them before something about that virginia tech defense always just kind of like they could show up and just be that day um, Virginia is the one where I'm, I'm I, I, I understand and respect that they're getting a lot of preseason respect and hype for, you know, their, their, their offense and their quarterback and, and, and Bron- what Broncos done has absolutely been an improvement from what Mike London did for him. But like, I don't, I just, I don't know where, what else about them sp- speaks to their, their danger. Like, I, I don't, uh, I understand. I don't. I just don't understand what it is. What's the substance? It's not the same way that I don't understand the substance of Michigan's, you know, being lauded. It's it's more so of like a what what are people expecting from Virginia that they've you know like has anything have they shown any particular signs? And maybe Chris, you can help me. You can help give me some context here because I've just looked at this Virginia thing as like a people are kind of just like crying wolf. It feels like I'm not sure what the basis is. Yeah, there are a couple things. Well, one you mentioned, it's a Bronco Mendenhall defense, and they've, they, I think they were up into the 30s in S&P Plus last year. And then offense, they have uh, Bryce Perkins is like the, a true dual threat quarterback, and he's sort of the guy where that offense might not be efficient, but on, you know, four or five drives, four drives to get, he can like rip something off and make something cool happen. 
Okay. Um, so, and they also last year, I think they were, they were ranked in the top 25. They lost at Pitt to home, which you never, never want to see, but they lost in overtime to Georgia tech and then Virginia tech. And then, yeah, I don't know how much stock to put in like bowl performances, but I think they blanked, uh, South Carolina 28, nothing. So it was sort of, they managed to recover from a really crushing end of the season where they let the division get away from them. I think it's just out of respect for Bronco Mendenhall and having a cool quarterback more or less. I think their secondary is also pretty highly respected, which maybe this is a game where it's just uh, Ian book can sort of like maybe take the, take the afternoon off and let the running game maybe help them out a little bit on this one. But yeah, I, it's definitely, I think maybe it's circled around now where it's overhyped yeah. as a threat. Like they're not that talented overall, but they are, they're a quality football team. Uh, it, but it's, it's a, it's a team that at home Notre Dame should be able to take care of. I think it's just the worry of, coming out of Athens, win or lose, you know you're going to be beat to hell. And so it's just sort of responding seven days later and being ready. Body blow theory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, fair enough, fair enough. I, I just I see everyone, every, every, every podcast I've listened to has kind of brought that up as the landmine of the season. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, but it's, again, one of those things. Is it really a trap when you, when you see it coming? Because if Virginia does – do what is expected because they're almost part of it is by default, it's probably not the right word, but it's, it's also out of the coastal who else is going to do it. And, you know, Virginia has the talent and they got the coaching, so it may as well be them. So therefore, Hey, that's a tricky game, but they may end up coming ring for all we know by the time it happens. And yeah. again, is that really a trap when you have a top 25 matchup? Well, we're going to keep going, but first we are going to take care of a little podcast business. And again, folks, for those of you on the stream, uh, this is going to be where we end up injecting our little uh, podcast ad. Uh, for those of you that are on Twitch, though, uh, please remember uh, you got those cheers that are literally pennies for you to inject yourself on the show. Of course, subscribe subscriptions help us as well. And if you have your Amazon Prime account linked, you can do that for free. So please keep that in mind and keep spreading the word because we enjoy the chat and enjoy all the fun ways everybody interjects themselves into the show. All right, so we've gone through like half of this conversation and we haven't even mentioned Southern Cal, which kind of makes me happy because I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but that should say that Southern Cal's on the trajectory that they should be. I I, I hope so. I There have been some good vibes there this offseason. I think after losing Cliff Kingsbury, you know, longtime Southern Cal offensive coordinator, they went and got uh, Graham Harrell and they've talked themselves into him as sort of, you know, discount. Kingsbury. I, I still have a little bit of PTSD from that game last year. We, we talked about how powerful the pass rush is, but if it's a situation where JT Daniels gets on a roll and can hit those short routes, but you know, it's sandwiched between Bowling Green and a bye week. It's a home game. Uh, and Notre Dame should be able to, to take care of it. Southern Cal could come in five and one. They could come in with a fired head coach. We really, that is going to be <laughs> heck of uh, a opening a uh, slate for them. It's all toss up games. Basically their whole season is toss up games, which means, yeah, they could go 10 to two or they could go five and seven. Although at that point, I think urban Meyer might be their head coach next year. So maybe for the long game, we should want them to be respectable this year. I'm not sure <laughs> what to root for in this situation. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, at this point, like <laughs> they could, they could show up like one in five. <laughs> I mean, I, there's something about USC now that like, you know, you know they have the weapons, but there is so much uncertainty in terms of their coaching and their actual development. Like there, there's been, I've never seen just so many people under the assumption of like, let me know when Clay Hilton's fired, guys. <laughs> because <laughs> for sure, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 almost so nebulous that no one really knows what to make of USC. So they're just kind of like letting them happen and 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 basically just waiting to hear about when they happen. But I mean, they start what Fresno State. Stanford, you know, BYU, Utah, Washington, Notre Dame. Who the fuck are they going to beat? <laughs> I can't pick. I mean, they, they, I'm, you could say Fresno maybe with the most confidence. But then? Yeah, Fresno lost a decent amount off last year's team. So you would hope, well, you, I'm not necessarily hope. You would think they could you would think, beat right. them at home. But maybe not. There's but no guarantee. What? I mean, it's hard to see how they, you know, you can't look at the schedule and say, this is going to be USC. Instead, this is going to be like, oh, there's another team in California that's pretty bad. <laughs> hey so ucla finally caught up just not the way they anticipated 
But yeah, it's it's so weird because yeah, the way that schedule does line up, Stanford always gives them fits. Utah is probably primed to be one of I mean, I I picked them to come out of the, the Pac twelve uh, demolition derby as as Ty put it. Uh but yeah, this it's gonna be rough for them. And man, you just hate to see it. But I I, I suppose if if there has to be anybody that puts them out of their misery, then all I ask is that we set up some live camera feeds on the tarmac of South Bend Airport, just in case. I'm just saying it, it would be gr- a tremendous content for everybody if that move gets pulled off again. <laughs> no, they'll just move to canceling his Uber without telling him. <laughs> now we're in the future. <laughs> That'll be the move. <laughs> But yeah, it's 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 so weird, and especially uh, because Chris, at the time when we were students, I mean, did you ever think that we would get to a moment to where we would in just be like, yeah, man, that SC game, if we lose that, that 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 just shouldn't happen. Like, we were no, always. Not, I mean, no, this is terrified. <laughs> <laughs> where where this is at i mean i so i was there from 04 to 07 so that was two absolute blowouts the bush push and then a 2006 game where i feel like that might be how the georgia game goes potentially where nd was always within like two touchdowns but you were never like felt great about their chances to, to actually win and and to be in this position the more i think about it the more i think this usc game is super important just because what follows it is which is the bye week so you never want to lose going into the bye weeks and you have to very stupid. true and but then at Michigan after that, so say Notre Dame beats Georgia, and God forbid, then they lose to USC. Well, then the playoff bid is on the line in Ann Arbor, or they lose to Georgia and they lose to USC. Well, then the New York Six bid is on the line in Ann Arbor, and so it's just not a situation where you want to. You don't want desperation going on the road to Michigan, even if they're overrated slightly. It's a place where Notre Dame, I believe, has won one time since like 1994. So we're gonna we need to try to. Uh, Keep, keep a clean sheet uh, going into the bye week, I think, against the Trojans. Yeah, so, I mean, you just might as well beat them by at least 50 or so and just, make it, <laughs> just make it nice and easy for, for everybody going forward. I will take a repeat of the 2017 game Dude, against yes. the Pac-12 champions. Um, I, I still think about so that. Please don't forget the fact that just because USC lost by 35 did not mean they didn't win the Pac-12 that year. That was a game where, no lie, two things happened in my household when I was running around screaming drunk off my ass that Notre Dame was beating the hell out of them. Uh, I scared the crap out of my son, who at the time was like (laughs) barely over two. (laughs) And and then my wife is just looking at me like, what is wrong with you? Like, you don't understand. I never thought this was possible. I didn't think I'd see the day. Um, but thankfully I, I just got to thank, you know, uh, really the entire athletic department. Uh, I, I should send them a thank you note or something. I don't know if the mail system still works over there. or If I address it to one AD, if that will still be the AD at the time the letter arrives there, it's just such a beautiful, beautiful mess. <laughs> <laughs> would you guys say, would you pick Chris, if you had to look at it, right? Their second week is Stanford USC. I know Stanford is ranked in the top 25, barely at 25 right now, preseason. Would you say these two teams are comparable? Would you be able to decipher or like, easily discern Stanford or USC is is better than the, its opposite? Oh, no, not at all. I, I think uh, in Connolly's Pac-12 previews, I think he called USC maybe the most uh, – he called one of them the most confusing team in the conference and the other one the second most confusing team in the conference. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so many question marks. And that game's so early that, honestly – by the time they, we play both of them, they could be look like completely different teams of, of what they were there. But that's that's such a huge game for both of those programs because, you know, they both play Washington. Uh, Stanford's got Oregon. USC's got Utah. Like there's some I mean, I think the Pac-12 is going to end up everybody with a couple losses at least. But there are some, you know, some heavy hitters mixed in there that you do not want to be losing your week to, especially USC hosting that game. Yeah, man. That's <laughs> And you go to BYU the next week. You yeah. want to talk about just getting ugly body blow game there. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea which one of those teams is better. I think I kind of put those two in with the Virginia schools. Okay. I kind of know what the Virginia schools are going to be. I have an, I, I have an idea and a concept of what they will be. Both USC and Stanford could be 10, 15 spots higher than those schools, or they could be five and seven. And I would not be surprised at any, pretty much any result from them. Yeah. And Stanford also, I mean, with the, the dramatic shift that is going to happen for those that haven't been paying attention, which God forbid, we know none of those are ever in our fan base, not paying attention to schools outside of us. 
They're they're going to be very interested to see that Stanford is not running the damn ball as much anymore. So I, I I'm also part of me wonders if Stanford's going to be a team that isn't quite settled with who they are with uh, KJ Costello being you know the guy and he doesn't have our Sega Whiteside anymore. Uh, it, it's going to be very interesting to see how they adjust because it's very it's going to be a very unshaw like team based on what we've seen in the past and. The only downside is that by the time Notre Dame actually heads over to Palo Alto and tries to vanquish those demons that have been there since 2007, um, they're going to figure out who they are by that point. But uh, how, how do you feel, Chris? you think they're going to settle in a little bit better? Do you think Shaw will get them on the rails? Will they be struggling? How do you, how do you see that game lining up? I, that's one where I'm kind of glad it's at the end of the season. So we'll have a better feel for, for both of these teams. Like, I mean, KJ Costello could in theory be uh, work his way into a first round pick at quarterback, or as you mentioned, if they can't run the ball and no one really steps up to replace uh, what was he at middle, middle St. Brown is there. They have a couple other random tall dudes there. They're plugging back in. They have a great left tackle in Walker little, but I don't know how the rest of that line is going to be. The defense has question marks. It's been kind of going downhill. Uh, but I don't, I mean, I feel like every season, two things happen. People predict Michigan to go to the playoff and they predict Stanford to fall apart and for this run to end. And neither of those things ever happen. Um, and so I don't want to get ahead of, a little bit ahead of our skis here uh, with them. But it, it, I think it comes down to if they can keep Costello healthy, they're going to have a thrower's chance in every game. But if that line is as bad as some people think it is, like I don't see how he's going to stay healthy over the course of a season. In again, their schedule outside of, I believe, uh, a trip to Oregon State is pretty much every game's in a coin flip realm. So, uh, you know, good luck to them. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it, it's, again, it's it's so unlike what I would expect Stanford to be. And I've always had my doubts about Shaw, but the one thing he was always able to put together was you, you had at least some solid beef continuously on that line. And then it was just finding, managing to find one or two right pieces on offense to to be good enough to put together, you know, eight to 10 win seasons on a fairly consistent basis. So it's just so weird to me th to sit here thinking right now that I probably won't figure out just how good or how bad Stanford may end up being until like week seven or eight into the season. And yeah. that just blows my mind. I mean, I was going to say Stanford's got Northwestern USC at UCF hosting Oregon. And then the, they end that six game weeks at, at Washington or hosting Washington. It's like, they're going to be, oh, look, they played a good a team and they performed well. Oh, look, they played their equal and no one knows what the fuck happened. Oh, look, they went to Florida and they, they came back really wet. And like, it's, it's, gonna be, it's just going to be, there's, there is no chance for them to acclimate to what Stanford is. You know, they're going from Northwestern, USC, UCF to Oregon, and then they get their breather at Oregon State. I feel like once they get to Oregon State, they can form an identity. But their first, the first four games of their season are chaos. That, that's at Oregon State, right? Are they in the road? Yeah, at Oregon yes. State. All right. Hopefully, you know, maybe they got some cooking Corvallis. At least make it interesting for a little bit. <laughs> Oregon State's due to, like, win one of these games, right? They have to at some point. Yeah, right? No one's <laughs> – if you go through their schedule, does anyone pick them to win a single one? <laughs> No, I don't think so. I, don't think so. I, I listened to the, the punt cast when they were doing uh, win total projections, and I want to say Oregon State was at one and a half. And, I mean, every, Cal Poly. and Cal Poly. everybody in unison said under. Oh. <laughs> so that, that should tell you how, how people are, are seeing that team right now. Uh, yeah. Now, one of the things that ended up uh, kind of coming up organically here, and, and it, and it kind of leads into uh, another like 30,000 foot question because. Notre Dame, the, the opponents that they're playing as far as uh, what Milfi did here is he put in uh, four-year recruiting rankings in a link and kind of broke it down. He got Virginia Tech 26, Virginia 44th, SC 16, uh, and Stanford 24, yet Notre Dame sitting at 14 on that four-year average. So, and that's been one of the weird things because it's been mentioned a couple different times. Uh, even when I was talking with Ty, he's like, Notre Dame's like a boring, good football team. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the success on the recruiting trail has, has been incredible. And that is in the midst of a four and eight absolute clusterfuck and disaster. Yet Notre Dame has still been able to amass the talent. And so, so Chris, that it's a very long way to ask this question is, you know, are, are you uh, feeling as good about the future and in the hands of Brian Kelly right now with the way the roster has been put together? 
you know, how, how are you feeling overall about not just this year, but looking into the future? Yeah, mostly pretty positive. This year, the you know, if all the verbal stick knocked on wood across, they're going to add some some top tier offensive playmakers. It seems like almost like the Looney Tunes where they're trying to plug a hole on of a dam and water is coming through, and every time they cover one, another one comes out with recruiting. So now <laughs> it seems like safety and corner are sort of the problem. Uh, you start looking at the 2020 depth chart for the secondary, and it gets kind of you're like, uh, can we have sixth year Sean Crawford? And I think anytime you're relying on the sixth year of a player who's had trouble staying healthy, that that's not a great sign but you know we've we've talked about the two most important things in college football are uh your quarterback and your defensive line they've recruited really well in those areas and probably number three is offensive line and they've done really well there as well and i think there's another step to maybe take if they keep stringing these seasons together four and eight really just stands out as kind of curbing momentum and if not for some of the late pickups they got in that class who knows where where we would be uh, but yeah, I think I think there's a lot of reason to feel positive going forward. Now the schedule uh, is is going to get tricky as as we move. Clemson keeps popping up, and you know if you think Notre Dame has a good class, like half Ooh. of Clemson's class is five stars in yeah. 22 and 23. I mean, if you want to really project out, Notre Dame plays Clemson and Ohio State in the same season, and that's you know that's in addition to SC and Stanford. And you know who knows where Ohio State is? Maybe Ryan Day will drive them into the ground. But historically, you know that's a that's a tough game. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons to to feel good about this this program. And hopefully, I mean, that's the main fear with this season. I, I feel it. And I think everybody I talked to kind of feels to like, is this going is this going a little bit too well? And as Notre Dame fans, we expect the rug to be pulling out from underneath us <laughs> and sort of just like wait and waiting for that other shoe to drop. And what if it doesn't, I guess? But yeah. that seems you know, it's a, that's a jinxy thing to say here as uh, we sit about a week before kickoff of the first game. Well, I know. I mean, but as we've looked through all these games, we've legitimately said, okay, it, you know, putting the homerism aside, like Georgia, you know, going to be the toughest, you know, absolutely. They've called it a coin flip would be kind. Notre Dame could win. Likelihood is probably won't. But after that, you was like, well, if you can get one of Michigan or at Stanford, that's a, that's a 10 win season. That's not too bad at all. That's actually pretty damn good, especially against a crazy ass schedule like this. So it, it's more like, I don't know. I almost feel like we're, we're programmed now as fans, like you say, we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. I think that's why we start looking at the, the Virginia type games. Like no, there's a trap somewhere. I know there's a trap and yeah. I'm going to find it. Listen, it, nobody was kicked off the team this off season. <laughs> nobody was arrested. <laughs> Someone's going to fucking lose to like Virginia. What? Just going to be Virginia. That's, that's the same. We, we end up negotiating our misery with what, what, how is it going to be formed? Hey, and, then, and we haven't even mentioned Navy, which is usually uh, right up there in our, our pain, <laughs> pain meter. But it's like, well, no, Navy's now is we, we found a functional defense. So hey, lo and behold, Navy ends up being, you know, only a concern of, can we make sure all of our legs are in place after the game is over? Um, yeah, and, and Kevin Austin, of course, uh, as Milfi points out, the double secret probation probably for four games. Who knows? Yeah, Nobody's but I mean, talking. But that's that's minor in the, the grand scheme of things. Because I mean, Dex was on that too, and hey, as soon as he got to touch the ball, look what happened. I was in Green Bay kicking ass. Yeah, you know, it's just it's we. I think the recruiting situation has been really, really good, and it's, of course, it's no mistake that we're that it's kind of peaking now that. You know, the, the program has had, what, three straight double-digit or two straight double-digit win seasons? You know, I mean, it's it's not an ex it's not a mistake. And I think 2012, since 2012 alone, things have changed. I mean, we can say what it, whatever we want about, you know, losing that, that game at the end. But having made it alone to the national title game has put Notre Dame to in a position to recruit at this level. That is even in spite of a lot of, you know, silently bad recruiters on the staff for a couple of years there. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. not silently Brian Van Gorder for fuck's sake, get out of here. <laughs> you know, Wait, he, he actually bothered. <laughs> no, that's a, no, he didn't. <laughs> that's the thing. In spite of all that, they've still managed to sustain this level of success. I mean, 14 for an average of four years. I mean, that puts them at least a couple of years in single digits somewhere. So, I mean, it's, it's impressive. And then we've, we've taken that and we've kind of like, you know, we've, we've achieved this, like, natural state of hey nothing's been shitty for a while what are we are, are we good is anything it's like when you have the kids and they've been quiet for too long you know are, are they dead someone's dead right yeah let's not use that example because when the kids are quiet for too long something happened it may yeah, not be exactly. bad 
<laughs> one of them may have just pooped themselves, one, they, or they may have just made a mess and got something they don't need to. But something happened you didn't want to have happen. Very much like different a tailgate. analogy. <laughs> it's just like a tailgate. Why has he? He's been quiet all the time. Oh, he shut himself. But no, I, I think in summary, though, I think we can safely say it makes no sense not to win every last football game. Or we should just start with waxing the floor with Louisville because. You know, uh, like we mentioned at the beginning of the show, or Chris did, apparently the previous coaching staff hated them. And the the, the way to heal and to be uh, rebuilt as humans is you got to get torn down at least one more time. So, I mean, one more we're, time. We're, yeah, we're helping exactly. helping the healing process of Louisville there. And, and then, you know, we got to make sure that Davey and BVG know that shit was not cool what they did here and, and let them know it. And then just... You know, beat Georgia, beat Michigan, beat SC, beat Stanford, avoid the Virginia traps, make sure Navy remembers where they belong in the pecking order, and hey, all of a sudden you're in the playoff again, and at that point you might as well just win those two games. I mean... I. I don't see anything wrong with that strategy. It sounds great to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, right? Sound. Yeah, sound, sounds perfect. All right, well, Chris, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate you taking the time. Looking forward to spending another football uh, season with you and the Rakes Report. And uh, can you remind people again uh, where to catch the report if they have yet to sign up? Yeah, sure. Uh, tinyletter.com slash rakes report. Uh, if you search, uh, there's, a, there's a supplementary podcast. It's not quite as fun as this one, but it's decent uh, wherever you get your podcast. It's just called the rakes report. Uh, yeah, that's that's the extent. Thanks so much, guys. This was this was a lot of fun. I I have, despite my best efforts of trying to maintain like a level of cool, that that last practice report where they were talking about Ian Book, you know, completing 90 some percent of his passes while Jeremiah was Moa runs around and Kyle Hamilton is apparently the best safety to ever play football. It's it's hard to keep it's hard to keep the excitement limited when uh, when you're hearing stuff like that. Oh no, it's great. Apparently all all the uh, book had to do was shave the mustache. It's like reverse Samson in, in porn <laughs> stash form. Yeah. As soon as he shaved it, it's like, oh, he's lighting the world on fire at 80, 90 percent clips again. Well, that, here's the question for you guys before we go, though. Would you rather just have him rock the mustache all season and be pretty good? Or, I mean, I guess the answer is shave the mustache and be great. But I do the mustache plus pretty good combo it does have its appealing. It was a good mustache. I enjoyed seeing it in the practice photos. If I was given an option of an alternate reality, I'd take it. <laughs> I just want to see it. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, everybody that joined us uh, out in the chat here on Twitch. And folks, we got actual football that is going to be happening. So make sure you stay tuned to HLS. We'll have picks coming Wednesday night. And of course, the NCAA Sim starts live Thursday evening. You can catch us live here on twitch.tv slash Her Loyal Sons. Check the podcast out on Spotify, anchor.fm, Her Loyal Sons, and wherever you get your podcasts at. And of course, we are always at HerLoyalSons.com. Till next time, go Irish, beat Cardinals. Have a good one. <laughs> <laughs>